Good evening and welcome to tonight's episode of Naturally Speaking. My name is Tracy Stone Manning. I'm in this week for Bryony Schwan, who was unable to make it. Tonight we're going to be talking about one of the most elemental things of life around us, and that's water and Missoula's groundwater. Um, with us we have Bill Worcester. He's a professor of geology at the University of Montana. And Charlie Vandham on the far left. He's an environmental planner with Land and Water Consulting, and Arvid Piller with Mountain Water Company. And later, Peter Nielsen, who is with the City County Health Department, is going to be joining us as well. And with that, I suppose, I'll ask you all to maybe think of some questions as you're listening to our guest speakers, because tonight we'll be taking live calls. So Bill, start us off. We're going to be talking about the past, the present, and the future of Missoula's aquifer. Bill's going to address a little bit about that. Well, my name is Bill Wussner, and I teach uh, groundwater geology at the University of Montana. And what I'm going to do today is, I guess, talk a little bit about the past, the, the far past, because we're going to talk about geological time and, and sort of how the aquifer formed here in Missoula. And uh, if I could have the first slide. What we're going to look at here is basically it's my main job as an educator, so I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about what groundwater really is. Could I have the next slide, please? When you think of groundwater, you have to think about it in terms of, of not underground rivers uh, flowing or caves, but you have to think about it more in terms of uh, sandbox that's when it rains it fills up with water and the water just sort of soaks in the sand so really groundwater is that water which occurs below the earth's surface in which all of the spaces between the grains of, of soil are filled with water and the upper surface of that is what we call the water table which is indicated as that uh, here on the slide and the blue area there would be then termed groundwater so when we talk about Missoula's groundwater we're really talking about that water which occurs below the water table in the Missoula area and again, think about it as water which is occurring uh, between the grains of sand and gravel and not as big sort of rivers or lakes. Next slide. And we talk about aquifers, and in Missoula we have what's called an unconfined or water table aquifer. And in this situation, it's basically that the water table forms the upper surface. So as we go below the surface in Missoula, we find coarse sand and gravel and that sand and gravel then becomes saturated or totally full of water oh, from 30 to 5 feet below the surface, depending on where you live. And that's what we talk about as our uh, groundwater system, and then we term that a water table aquifer. So we have a water table aquifer here in the Missoula Valley. Next slide. And we also are curious when we do research about how groundwater moves around. It's really pretty straightforward when you think about it. Groundwater just flows from areas of, of high water table to areas of low water table. So as indicated on this diagram, you can see where the water table is actually higher up, higher in elevation, the water then flows from those high areas to areas where they're lower. And so we can map out the direction of groundwater flow pretty much by just looking at uh, the uh, position of the water table. So we go out and measure water levels in wells to try to figure out how groundwater actually moves. Next slide. The other thing to think about groundwater is that it is dynamic. It's not just a pool that's sitting underground. And it gets confusing because we talk about groundwater reservoirs. And a reservoir you think about as a dam and a lake, but it's not like that at all. It just means a big saturated bunch of sand and gravel that is storing water. And the water table fluctuates during the year. If we look at this diagram, this is really sort of what it looks like in the Missoula Valley. 
that the water table is typically lowest when we get into May, into, excuse me, into March and uh, early April, and then it rises as all the spring snow melt occurs and the rivers start running full. The water table rises the highest uh, then right about this time of year in uh, late May and into June, and then it declines all the way back into winter again until it starts over again, that process, year after year. So if everything works right, it's a renewable resource where water is added to the groundwater system and then is removed from the groundwater system on an annual basis. Next slide. Please. Then if we talk about water supply, and, and uh, Arvid Hiller will talk a little more about that uh, uh, for mountain water, but the other thing to think about is when you turn your well on out there in the valley, why, is water, why does water actually come into your well? And all that happens, as you can see from this diagram, is that when you turn the well on and start pumping water out, you actually lower the water table around the well. And if water flows from high areas of water table to low areas of water table, then just think about it in terms of that the water is flowing to the low spot, which is created by the well. And then that's why the water then can be pumped out of the ground and you actually get groundwater then coming up. Next slide. And just one more thing to think about, if you have lots of wells in an area, of course all of them are trying to lower the water table some to try to get water to move towards them. And this is what this diagram gives you an idea about, is that these, these things we call the cones of depression, that area of low water table around the well, that the more wells that you put in an area, then they start, start to actually interact with each other. And uh, so depending on how much pumping is going on and what the density of wells are, there may be problems sometimes. Next slide. Well, now let's just talk for just a minute about the Missoula groundwater system. And this is a, a slice through the earth, like looking at a piece of pie. And it's a, basically a representation of a north-south slice across the Missoula Valley. You can think about it going right up Reserve Street, maybe, for example. Uh, and what we have here is that you'll see that the brown represented here is bedrock. It's the same hard rock that makes up Mount Sentinel, and that rock is over a, a billion years old. So it's very old, and it makes up the mountains and the hillsides around here. And then the white area that you see here, we call the tertiary sediments, and that area is actually uh, very fine grain. It's about 2,000 feet of, of silts and clays that have filled up the valley. And then above that is really our lifeblood. It's the Missoula Aquifer, and it's only about 150 feet thick, and it's coarse sand and gravel. So in a very simplest terms, if you looked at the Missoula Aquifer, you'd find that all of the water that we want uh, is coming from a very thin veneer of sand and gravel over top of uh, other deposits which do not uh, yield water very easily. Next slide. Here's just an example of what that bedrock looks like. And if you think about that, you do get water out of it, but it's very difficult because it only occurs in the fractures of the rock. So to yield water from bedrock is usually that you can't get very much. So it's not a very good aquifer. It could never supply the whole city of Missoula or the, the whole valley out of the bedrock as an aquifer. Next slide. Please. Now here we have the, the landfill area, and that happens to be located in, up in the tertiary sediments, which are on the side hills and underneath of the Missoula Valley. And these are very fine grain. It's, it's again, fairly difficult to find water because it is relatively... Uh, uh, hard to yield water out of this. It's uh, just, they don't make very good aquifers. They're not very continuous. So they're, again, not good water-bearing units. We can't drill deeper in Missoula, in other words. You can't go down below the, uh, the system and try to find more water after we get out of the sand and gravel. And the last slide that I have relates to what we're all used to seeing if we live in the Missoula Valley. And that's the sands and gravels and cobbles that, that we dig up in our gardens and that we excavate when we build a house, and that's really our aquifer system. And as we think about it for the rest of the discussion this evening, I guess the last thing I want to leave you with is that, that it's, we have a very thin skin, which is a very thin soil zone on top of this very coarse sand and gravel system, and, and that's our only protection because there's nothing to stop pollution or other uh, contaminants moving down through that very coarse sand and gravel to the water table. That's the same water table that we're basically getting all of our drinking water from. Thank you, Bill. Um, next, we're going to have Arvid Hiller speak. Arvid is the Vice President and General Manager of Mountain Water Company. He's going to address what they're doing about the groundwater issues in Missoula. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bill has just described to you the uh, 
how the water gets into this valley and I'm going to describe to you what we do with that water and as a result of that what we have recognized as being some of the responsibilities of being a water purveyor. First to kind of give you a background of Mountain Water Company, we are a, an investor owned utility that serves about 50,000 residents of Missoula with uh, potable water um, for their daily use. It comes out of 34 deep water wells that average around 140 to 150 feet deep. Uh, we have a production capacity during uh, uh, any single day of, of, of as high as 60 million gallons uh, a day and our annual production ranges from 7 to 10 billion gallons a day. We have about 200 miles of transmission mains, that's how you receive your water there. Uh, at your home through the transmission mains and we have storage facilities that we pump into uh, to uh, augment the uh, pumping capacity of around 7 million gallons. Um, coincident with me becoming general manager about three years ago, our largest well, the Maurice well, which uh, sits over by the Maurice, Maurice Avenue Bridge in the area of the University of Montana, it's a large well, pumps about 500 uh, gallons, uh, excuse me, it's a 500 horsepower well, pumps somewhere around uh, six to 7,000 gallons a minute, 10 million gallons a day. And uh, that is one of the things that really heightened our awareness is the potential for contamination of the, of the resource here that we serve to the customers. Uh, we, we had a notification that it, within our system we had a, a contamination and it became evident to us uh, rather soon that a sewage lift station in the area of that uh, well had malfunctioned and caused this contamination. Uh, that resulted in us having to issue a boil order for four days. During that four days, we maintained our telephones on a, almost a 24-hour basis. And uh, during that time, we had some 6,000 telephone calls. It became real evident to us that people in our community were concerned and it's the first time it was really brought to their attention how susceptible this contamination or this aquifer is to contamination. One of the predominant comments that came from those customers that called us, although there was some criticism and some real heightened concern about health effects, uh, the predominant response was, well, maybe this isn't so bad, that now we realize how susceptible this aquifer is to contamination and we need to do something about it. This is what motivated a lot of the activity in the valley and uh, in regarding the interagency task force which we were a part of. We had been working on a wellhead protection and an aquifer uh, protection program and it was in the research stage but it had not gotten to the point where it really was producing a result of somehow that we could protect this resource. We had decided as an investor-owned utility that we still were not precluded from a responsibility that to try to move forward the protection of this resource for the community. It is our livelihood, but more importantly to the community, uh, people in, in this state need to realize that Mountain Water Company does not own the water. Mountain Water Company just serves the water. The residents and all of the citizens of Montana have the right to the use of that water. Uh, and so we are charged with serving it, but we are also charged with make sure, making sure that it's protected. So we embarked on a wellhead protection study that uh, utilized a firm out of Helena, Montana called Hydrometrics. Involved uh, with that was a hydrogeologist by the name of, of uh, Ray Lezouk. And under their uh, uh, umbrella, of moving towards this study. They brought in the local city county health department to do source surveys of potential contaminants to the aquifer and um, also a local planner, Charlie Vandam, who's with us tonight, and uh, John Horwich, an attorney out at the uh, University of Montana in law school. Uh, we recognized that it was very easy and it can be very easy for people to forget how important it is that we protect this resource. Corresponding this with this wellhead protection program that we embarked on, which was really the technical end of the work that had to be done, we realized we needed to keep the public's awareness up of the 
need to protect this resource. We uh, thought it most appropriate that we utilize a local firm, uh, in this case it was Spiker Communication. Uh, we contacted them with all of our concerns and said, what is the, the main thing that we want to do with the public information education program? And it was that we wanted to keep the heightened awareness of the public as to the potential for our resource to be conta become contaminated because we felt if we kept it to the forefront that a lot of the hard choices that have to take place in a community to protect the resource as valuable as ours were going to have to be popular. They were going to have to be ones that people could accept that they're important enough and they're overriding enough uh, importance is that we have to do it regardless that there may be some expense associated with it. So we embarked on, and you've seen as I'm talking here, some of the illustrations of some of the billboards we've all, that we put out uh, around different places in the public just to keep that up. I think the result of those efforts has been not only recognized from the media world in Montana and that they have given uh, Spike Communication Awards for their efforts in this area. If you've noticed, the messages are simple. Uh, they are continually around the theme that we need to protect the resource. I think that the benefits of this has really been acceptance in this community that we do have to put this resource as number one. And when the hard choices have been made, a water quality district that was created last December of 92, the community was ready for that. There are other hard choices coming up in the future that are going to have to be made. Peter Nielsen of the City County Health Department, who's here tonight, is going to address those, some of those choices and, and how we've arrived at those. And we think that if people are just kept abreast of the fact that the alternative is not remediation of problems in water. Every piece of literature that you will read, put out by the EPA or put out by people that have studied taking things out of water, say that it's not the economical solution, that it is the last solution that you want to look at, that the best thing to do is keep things out of the water. We're hopeful by doing that in this community, we will be able to maintain this valuable resource. We have what is rated as one of the 10 best aquifers in the country when it comes to the quantity and quality of water that we have. It flows 425,000 acre feet of water through it annually at a rate of three feet to 10 feet per, uh, excuse me, three feet to 27 feet per day. Um, that is one that we have to keep clean. It's the best alternative and the cheapest alternative for the people that are going to utilize that water. With that, I would finish. Uh, just for one point of reference for the viewers, you mentioned that the, the Morris well had been contaminated. Um, what was the contaminant and how did it get into the aquifer? The contamination resulted from a sewage lift station uh, that was about 140 feet up gradient from our well. Uh, malfunctioned for four days and the actually the site there was surcharged with water to uh, levels above its ability to contain it and in fact it flow, overflowed into the river at the time but it also overflowed into the ground and I think it best illustrated what Bill Wusner was saying about the uh, inability for our aquifer in Missoula because of its porosity being able to treat effluent of any kind and the fact that it travels so fast down through the gravel that it does that. Coliform bacteria was a contaminant. Uh, we even had a, a sample that had fecal coliform in it. Usually those particular coliform bacteria and bacteria die in a very short time of travel. So it would illustrate that within that distance of 140 feet, ground 40 feet, lineal feet, and then down gradient through the aquifer of about 80 feet, that, that was not sufficient treatment by the soils to to eliminate the uh, coliform bacteria contamination. Thank you. Um, our next speaker this evening is Charlie Vandom. He's an environmental planner with Land and Water Consulting here in Missoula. Um, he's going to discuss about the efforts of proactive planning and how they can help aquifers. Thanks, Tracy. Um, I work with uh, Land Water Consulting. We're an environmental firm, environmental consulting firm in Missoula, and we, I get involved in different levels of work related to groundwater contamination and groundwater protection. Some of the work that I enjoy work, I enjoy getting involved in is, is groundwater protection, 
and working with companies like Mountain Water Company to develop uh, wellhead protection plans or groundwater protection plans to try to protect the water supply. Um, on the other side, I also get involved in with uh, I work with companies, with corporations, with individuals that uh, are cleaning up properties that have soil contamination, have groundwater contamination, and I deal directly with the cost that's associated with trying to clean up properties. We at Land and Water um, have tried to promote more proactive stance in groundwater protection. We like working in consulting firms where we're trying to, or in consulting where we're trying to protect the resource, protect the water supplies, and we see see that it's more a lot more cost effective to get involved in the early stages of planning to try to protect groundwater supplies rather than coming back and cleaning up groundwater contamination. In the efforts of in working with Mountain Water Company, uh, we worked on a, a wellhead protection ordinance. It was a, a ordinance intended to protect Mountain Water Company's wells by um, requesting or regulating businesses that could have regulated substances or uh, what many people look upon as hazardous materials. We try. Our focus was to, or, or what we had recommended to Mountain Water Company was to, to regulate those materials and try to prevent those types of materials from entering into the groundwater and causing a groundwater contamination problem. Um, this, what we see in trying to be proactive is that we need to make an investment um, up front rather than trying to come back and clean up properties later on. This uh, wellhead protection ordinance that we developed for Mountain Water Company is, is, uh, was a draft regulation that um, we were, hope, were hoping that the Missoula County and the City of Missoula could look at as in perhaps adopting in a means in trying to protect the groundwater supply. And we're still hoping that they can to get to that stage. Um, Again, I've been involved in, in several sites around Missoula where we're cleaning up uh, contamination from whether, whether it be class 5 injection wells or, or dry wells that have come from automotive shops or leaky underground storage tanks. And, and some of the people that, some of the companies and corporations and individuals that have been involved in cleaning up the contamination have been paying I have incurred costs that uh, range from anywhere from $5,000 to $200,000. Those are costs that I think few people want to incur and perhaps if they were to face those types of costs they'd be more willing to invest in proactive measures to prevent that kind of contamination. We are encouraging the work that uh, the Missoula City County Health Department has taken as far as developing a water quality district and, and looking at regulation to try to help prevent further contamination in the aquifer and also trying to help out in public education efforts as far as protecting the water supplies. One of the more uh, exciting projects we're getting involved in right now is the development of the Missoula Water Partnership which is a volunteer group of organizations throughout Missoula that are trying to promote activities that encourage people's awareness of the sensitivity of groundwater in Missoula and surface water in Missoula. Uh, we have to find ways to encourage more individual responsibility and corporate responsibility in protecting our water supplies and we're hoping the Missoula Water Partnership can be an integral part of promoting that awareness and promoting that responsibility. Again, I think the City County Health Department has taken some great steps as far as adopting the Water Quality District, but we hope to see um, public education as being a key element in any type of groundwater protection strategy that we develop. Not only regulation, but education is a crucial part 
of any type of measure to try to protect the water supplies. I have just a, a couple of questions as a follow-up. You spoke of individual responsibilities and corporate responsibilities. Can you give us some real nuts and bolts examples of, of what they may be? For example, what would my individual responsibilities be as, as a person living in the Missoula Valley? Well, in a lot of our actions that we take, we, there are many issues that we juggle in, in any kind of action we take. Let's say, for example, disposing of a, a gallon of waste oil. Uh, we, from a cost-effective standpoint, we, a lot of times we want to take the easiest and most, the, the cheapest opportunity and, and perhaps dump it on the ground. Um, but that's lacking the awareness of the sensitivity of the resource, of the sensitivity of the groundwater in Missoula. And as far as individual responsibility, we have to understand those, the sensitivity of the aquifer and try to be aware of that and look at alternatives as far as disposing and looking at recycling motor oil, recycling paints, um, and try to be aware of materials that could cause damage to the aquifer and use them in a responsible manner and try to avoid disposing them in, in ways that could cause contamination. Uh, what would some corporate responsibilities be? I think it, it's, it's the same thing. I think um, corporations have to realize that they're a part of this community and uh, the actions that they ta take can impact um, this community, whether it contaminates the groundwater or um, in a more direct sense, contaminates their own ground and they're, they're forced with paying for it. Um, we're basically all partners in Missoula trying to protect the resource that we have and I think it is our job um, to learn about the sensitivity, of the sensitivity of the groundwater and to learn about what actions we can take to reduce the impacts on the groundwater, to reduce the contaminants or contamination that could occur on the groundwater and surface water also. Okay, thank you. Um, our last guest to speak this evening is Peter Nielsen. He is with the City County Health Department. Thanks for inviting me to speak on this show. It's a pleasure to be with this distinguished group of gentlemen and, uh, and yourself as well. Uh, we, we're real fortunate in this community to have folks like this who pitch in and, and help out with problems that we're, we're working on to take care of our water quality, to have the strong scientific support that we've got from Bill Woosner and his graduate students and others at the University of Montana. We're very lucky to have that resource in this community. Uh, to have a water company like Mountain Water that's willing to uh, put up its dollars and uh, to speak as an advocate for taking care of our water, uh, we're very fortunate for that. And one of the things that we're most fortunate for is to have a very broad base of public support for taking care of our water in the community. And, the organization that Charlie Bandom has helped organize and others in the community, uh, the Water Partnership and other, other groups in the community have, have spoken out very, very, very forcefully for taking care of our water. And this is just a real good, healthy combination. Uh, so it's a real, it's real pleasure to be here with these folks and uh, to talk about our water. I'm anxious to get on to viewer call-in so that we can get some questions and get some dialogue going, but I, I wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, it's nice to be able to back clean up and be the, the fourth speaker to speak and uh, to round up this this this, uh, this important panel. I want to talk a little bit about the health department's role in all of this. The health department uh, is a city and county agency uh, that uh, is responsible for taking care of to, uh, protecting the health and the welfare of the citizens of the Missoula Valley. And the health department has very important roles in doing that that range from uh, providing uh, health services to people who can't pay for them through our partnership, partnership health uh, care system at the, at the health department, as well as nursing, nursing services, uh, women and uh, infants and children services. Our environmental health division takes care of air quality, water quality, sanitation, and restaurants, and trailer courts, and all these sorts of things. But when you come right down to it, one of the very basic things that we need to take care of in this community to take care of public health is water. Uh, we're all made up of water. Water is a very, very important resource for us uh, uh, to 
in terms of public health and also in terms of the economic vitality of the region. We've got to take care of this very basic resource in order to continue to exist here and in order to be able to stay here and prosper as a community. We need to have a, vi a viable water supply. Uh, our role at the health department has been increasing pretty steadily over the last several years in terms of taking care of our water supply in Missoula ever since the Maurice Avenue well incident that kind of gives a wake-up call about how how vulnerable we were to water pollution in the community, uh, we've become more proactive and more active. And I believe uh, very seriously that our department will be consumed by water quality issues for the next 10 years, much as we have been consumed with air quality issues for the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, these are going to be very, very important issues. And in fact, they may hit home more, uh, more directly for a wider variety of people in the community than air quality has. So our department has been uh, taking that very seriously, and the public has demanding us to be very much more active and proactive in protecting our water. Last year, we got very serious about trying to form uh, what Charlie's spoken about, uh, uh, the water quality district here in Missoula. And I want to talk just a little bit about that. That water quality district was created by the city council and the county commissioners in January of this year. And the water quality district is going to be a very important tool for us to be able to take care of our Missoula Valley Aquifer. Uh, I want to start by showing a, a map here of what this is so people know where we're talking about. Hopefully you can zoom in on this. I'll try to hold it real still. This map, to give you a little orientation, this is the urban area of Missoula. I'll use this pen for a pointer. This is the urban area, the downtown area. This is Interstate 90. This is where East Missoula is. And out here on the west end is Yusan. There we go. Down on the south is Lolo. This red line that encircles the valley is the area that was designated uh, by the United States Environmental Protection Agency in 1988, I believe it was, as, the, as a sole source aquifer. What that means is uh, it's our only source of water in, in the valley, and there's really no economically practical alternative supply for us. We can't go to surface water. We can't go drill our wells anywhere else at, at, a, at a reasonable price. So we've got to get our water from here. And we live on top of our water, so we've got to take care of how we, take care of how we, uh, how we act and how we, uh, uh, what we do to our water. This black line that surrounds the, the red line is the boundary of the water quality district that was created by the commissioners and by the city council in January of this year. So it extends basically, from, again, from East Missoula on the east and up to Yusan, past Frenchtown on the west, and down to Lolo on the south. Now, if I could switch to the slide that's showing. There we go. That slide describes a number of words, the, the basic objectives of what we're trying to do with the Water Quality District. The first, well, first of all, the mission of the district is very basic. It's to, it's to protect and improve both the quality of surface water and groundwater in the Missoula Valley. In order to accomplish that mission, we're undertaking six basic objectives. And again, this all starts in July of this year, although the commissioners created the, uh, the district in January. We don't have any of the money uh, from the district until July 1st. So it's getting very close. We're, we're getting ready to get geared up and have this program up and running in, in, in July. The first objective that we're looking for is to conduct monitoring and water quality research uh, to assess and prioritize water quality issues throughout the Missoula Valley. We've been fortunate to already have a good start on research in the valley uh, through the efforts of Bill Wozner and Mountain Water and others, but we still need to know much more about what we're doing with water quality in the valley. One of the things that we have to do is to be, to be uh, very certain that we're, we're uh, targeting our dollars effectively. When we're, going to, when we're going to spend dollars to protect water quality, we need to know that we're spending them on the most important things. Uh, we need to diagnose the patient before we prescribe a cure. It's a lot like when you go to the doctor, if you're, not, uh, if you're feeling ill, you expect a pretty good diagnosis of what your illness is before your doctor starts prescribing cures. We need to do the same thing for our, for our aquifer. The second objective, briefly, is to uh, 
to conduct inspections of businesses, facilities that can affect water quality in the valley. Get out into these, these, these businesses and facilities and, and help, help these, these places understand how they can minimize the threats to the water quality, how they can comply with the regulations, and how we can prevent water pollution in the community. The third objective is to uh, is basically to conduct enforcement of, of uh, water quality regulations in the valley. And it's a very important tool that we have not had in the past. It's very surprising to a lot of people that we have not had enforcement authority uh, to take care of our own water in the Missoula Valley. And the reason for that is that all that enforcement authority uh, rests with either the state or the federal government. We now, with the Water Quality District, will have the capability of having that enforcement authority directly delegated to us from the state to enforce the state water quality law. That's a tool that we very much need. We don't. We no longer will have to do what we had to do last summer when we caught folks dumping uh, toxic materials into the storm drains on Patty Street here in downtown Missoula. We'll no longer have to cite them for littering on public streets and get $50 fines for that. We'll be able to cite them for, for, for violating water quality statutes and we'll be able to take a better, better care of our water as a result. The fourth objective is to conduct public education, and I agree wholeheartedly with Charlie, this is a very, very important objective. There's no amount of regulation that we can do in the community, no amount of coercing or beating people around the shoulders that we can do that will be successful in uh, convincing everyone to comply and, uh, and protect our water, unless people understand the importance of taking care of our water, and, are, and more importantly than that, are more bro are broadly committed to taking care of water quality in the community. Public education is a very important priority for us. The fifth objective is planning. We've never had a long-term plan for taking care of our water in the valley. We've been reacting to crises. Uh, we've been reacting to this issue and that issue, and usually after the fact. And that's a very inefficient way to take care of things, as both Butch and Charlie said, it costs much more money to clean up pollution, especially when it's under the ground in your groundwater, than it does to prevent the pollution from happening in the very first instance. So it's important for us to plan ahead, find ways to prevent pollution, and work together as a community to, to get everybody broadly committed to taking care of the water. The uh, last objective is to finance facilities to protect water quality, and this is an, a limited objective. We have only $100,000 maximum per year to spend on this, uh, but we can do things like, like extend sewer mains into areas that are highly densely populated and uh, are potentially polluted by, by a variety of sources, and uh, we can take care of things like that with, with, this, with these dollars. But we're very excited about the capabilities that we have with the Water Quality District. To, uh, to begin to address some of these problems. But I want to stress that it's very important for everyone in the community to understand that um, it's not the kind of situation where you can say, well, now we've got a water quality district, the government's going to be able to take care of the problem for us. Water quality doesn't, doesn't work that way. Uh, we're going to be able to have very strong tools with the water quality district, we'll have better knowledge of enforcement tools, we'll be able to do public education, but unless everyone gets committed to solving this problem together, and uh, understands that we all need to pull together and do our part, we're not going to succeed in taking care of our water. So it's very important that everyone has worked together. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to remind the viewers that this is a call-in show. Uh, we're on live. The number is 542-6228. We'll take your calls, and one of these gentlemen will hopefully answer you. Uh, Peter, I had a couple questions about the Water Quality District, and you said uh, that public education is really important. Um, did you find that the public uh, wasn't educated to, to the point of um, accepting the notion of a water quality district? Were you up to speed there? How did that process go? Well, I think it went quite well. The uh, amount of protest that we had to create in the Water Quality District was relatively small, although there was a vocal protest from those who did protest. What was it? And, and the, it was about 7.5%. No, I mean, what was the actual protest? Uh, well, was... how did that work? Did you mean yeah, well, what were they protesting? Okay, the way this works is that the commissioners and the city council proposed creating this Water Quality District, and that means that, that uh, we establish fees that everyone pays for in the valley, everyone who owns property with improvements on it pays a basic fee into this water quality district. For the basic home water in Missoula, that's $9 per year or about 75 cents per month. 
for people who live outside the urban area that are not connected to a public sewer, it's $13 per year, which is about a dollar and eight cents per month. So the commissioners proposed this program that I've described very briefly, and we mailed out a postcard to everybody letting them know that this was coming, and they had a 30-day period in which to protest creation of the district. This occurred last November and December for anybody who missed that. Um, I think it was pretty widely discussed and most people were aware it was going on. At any rate, uh, during that time period, if one out of five people were to protest the creation of the district, that would have caused it to go to a referendum. It would have been put on the May, the May ballot this year. That did not happen. Uh, the amount of protests that we got in a 30-day period was about 7.5%. And that speaks, I think, very loudly about the amount of uh, support that we have for taking care of our water and the amount of understanding that people have in the community about how important it is to protect our aquifer, not only for public health, but also for the future economic vitality of this area. Arvid, your um, Mountain Waters billboards, was there a reaction to that? Did you get phone calls saying, what do you mean I can't pour paint down the drain? I don't get it. I mean, did anybody, did you get calls? Actually, we got a lot of comments from people, not only friends, but uh, business associates, uh, service organizations that I belong to and other people belong to. The simplicity of the billboards, I think, is what impressed them most. The theme is what impressed them, and the simplicity is what got that theme across and kept it in the forefront. It really is easy. Everybody has seen the uh, the ad on national TV, pay me now or pay me later when it comes to uh, filtering, I think it is, changing the filter on a car. Well, they, the fact is, is that it's, the simplicity of the message is what they commented on. But the, they said, it, every time they said, it sure doesn't hurt us to be reminded mm -hmm. that we have a personal responsibility as either an individual in a household or as a business to see that we don't. Uh, do those things that are improper that can, uh, can contaminate. So uh, the, the re reactions are, were, uh, without exception, positive towards the approach that we took when it comes to the scene. Well, I think it is important. Um, this is all fairly new. I mean, my, uh, my parents, when they taught me to paint and clean, and I was never told that bleach couldn't be poured down the drain or that it's a bad idea to just chuck oil in the back alley. It's just not something we learned. I think we have a caller. Is this true? No, we don't have a caller. <laughs> so go to your phones, 542-6228, to call in to MCAT to ask these folks about water quality. Um, who among you can tell us about um, towns or valleys whose water quality has gone bad and why it went bad? and what steps were taken, and the costs involved in cleaning it up. Do we have any case examples we could talk about? I might, I might, I might just mention that it's not in this country, but about a year, year, a little over a year ago, the mayor from uh, a sister city in Germany, a uh, sister city in Missoula, was here. He made a comment that really struck me, because we were going through what our efforts were in trying to protect the resource. And uh, through his interpreter, he indicated that he thought we were very, very uh, fortunate in approaching it the way we were with proactive approach because he said if their city had approached this a thousand years ago, that their water would not cost a hundred times what our water costs here. So uh, he's saying that treatment was their only only alternative. And I, I just really uh, drove into me the, the fact that this is not a new issue. It's an old issue that wasn't addressed before. So. Uh, and certainly other people here have instances of communities that have had contamination problems. Tracy, I might mention that uh, just downstream from us in Coeur d'Alene and Spokane, those two communities have been real proactive about protecting water supplies. They have a very similar aquifer that we have in Missoula, and uh, they began efforts to try to protect their water supply over 15 years ago and been very successful at it. Um, we are kind of following their lead in a sense as far as the type of measures we're looking at to try to protect the water supply and, and type of regulations and things like that. In, in Coeur d'Alene, for example, they have um, 
instituted a, a zoning regulation that uh, requires or limits densities of one housing unit per five acres in areas that uh, do not have essential sewer system, um, which is pretty sparse density uh, relative to Missoula standards. And uh, that uh, type of concern that Coeur d'Alene expressed has really been effective as far as encouraging the extension of sewer in uh, to outlying areas and also encouraging infill development in, in places where we have investments in infrastructure. I just might make a comment. I was on a, down at the airport recently and somebody went over and got a drink of water, an older gentleman, and he sat down and he made the comment. He said, you know, this is the first place I've been in 10 years where I could drink the water. Wow. And, and I thought that that sort of struck home as I was listening to him. And he said, you know, he, he, he said, talked like he had traveled around to a lot of different cities, but he was still at the point where where he, he had drank Missoula water and he thought that it tasted like, it tasted good. It wasn't something he, you know, he could stand, in other words. It was it's not where you go to some cities and everything is heavily chlorinated or you go to, to other areas where it's just poor quality in general. But I think your comment, I mean, have there been whole aquifers that have been totally destroyed? And, and I'm sure there have been, but more often it's wells that are serving large populations that have become contaminated from a very small source. We've had instances in the Missoula Valley where a, a storm drain or point source can, can affect over a, a square mile of, of aquifer and degrade the water quality just from, from a single you know, point source spreading out as it moves through the aquifer. So very often there are wells like the Marie Street well here in Missoula where that one well, even though it was a, a, a local contamination problem, it affected a large number of people. And a, there are lots and lots of examples like that all across the United States. We were talking tonight about um, proactive planning for the future of our aquifer. And Bill, I believe you're doing a study um, that's going to hopefully lay some groundwork for us. So could you tell us about that study? Well, we hope so. What we're trying to do is, uh, is to look at how septic system use actually affects the groundwater in the whole Missoula County, not just the Missoula Valley. And that includes areas like uh, Sealy Lake and, and uh, Condon and uh, looking around Frenchtown area and then down here around Missoula too. And what we hope we'll, we'll end up with is some foundation about what really happens when you we use septic systems and drain fields to dispose of our waste. Uh, in some areas, the geology and the aquifer characteristic is such that that, that, that kind of disposal may be just fine. Uh, but in other areas, it may be extremely critical because of everyone who has one of those septic systems typically also has a well. And so they're basically drinking sometimes out of the same aquifer within which we put our waste. And if the septic system does a good job and there's treatment in the soil, then uh, you know they work fairly well. But uh, there are some geologic environments in the valley where they don't work very well, and I think we've got to figure out where those are, and then there has to be uh, plans accordingly to, to address that in the future. We're going to have more growth in this area. Well, we were talking also earlier, actually, I'll get back to this. As part of this study, we have a graduate student who's looking for a place to monitor. Uh, he needs a monitoring site west of Reserve Street. His name is Tom, help me out. Mahalik. Mahalik. Yeah, it took me a while. I hope that's <laughs> right, Tom. <laughs> um, Tom is going to be looking at uh, septic tanks out by Reserve Street, and he needs some people to come forward and uh, offer up their homes, I suppose. And the, Here's what he's looking for. The home must have a conventional septic tank and a drain field that conforms to current building codes. Um, and several years of continuous septic system use is preferred. He'll need access, obviously, to the ground overlaying the drain field to install a couple shallow monitoring wells. And ideally, the yard area should not be highly landscaped because he's going to be digging in there. Um, there should be an open area, a field or a pasture to the west of the drain field, for a distance of several hundred feet. Um, if this all sounds like something you've got, you may want to continue to listen to this list. There also should be a little development to the east of the site. He needs a site where the impact of a single septic system can be distinguished from the cumulative effects of many systems. So if you're interested, you can call him at 243-2341. And if you need to refer to this list, um, it was compiled by Sherry Devlin in today's Missoulian. So, if you're out by Reserve Street and you want to help out with groundwater, you may want to give him a call. 
And I'd like to remind everyone that this is a live call-in show. The number is 542-6228. Tracy, can I get back a little bit to the, the cost issue that you brought up a few minutes ago? Please do. That, um, I think that uh, you know, it's important for us to, to think about what it costs to, to replace a well. Uh, uh, but it's all, there are other costs associated with polluting groundwater. Uh, last fall, when we, we talked about creating the Water Quality District, we were talking about having everybody pay a fee. And we wanted to be able to say, well, what are you going to get for that fee? And we were able to do that, but we also were hoping to say, well, what can we avoid paying in the future if, if this is successful? So we did a little research at the time into what uh, what other communities have suffered in terms of economic damage from water quality and pollution. And what we found was, was a little bit more staggering than I expected. When we started to look into it, we looked at uh, we expected the, the most significant cost for communities to be uh, polluting a given well and then having to dig a new one or having to put on a waste treatment system. And we found that those costs were, in fact, fairly significant. Uh, there are communities in uh, throughout this region. There's a community in, in Montana called uh, Sheridan, Montana, that had to replace its public water system. And I can't remember the total cost on it, but it worked out to be something like $939 per person in the community just to put a new water system in. That's a pretty steep bill compared to investing $9 per month to avoid that cost. Here in Missoula, we looked at what the cost would be if we had to put all of the water that runs through mountain water system on a treatment system to, to, to treat some very persistent pollutants. We found that that cost would be roughly $20 million. And that would re result in a, in a a rate increase at, under today's rate structure is something like $35 per month for everybody in the valley. And that's a pretty significant cost. But those costs were dwarfed. Those kinds of costs were dwarfed. In a study that was done in Minnesota of 21 different communities that had water, water contamination from uh, toxic substances, primarily solvents, metals, those kinds of things that really can damage the water supply. And in those communities, sure, they had significant cost of having to replace their wells and having to put in water treatment systems, but they, they suffered much more long-term costs in terms of uh, losses to their tax base, lost business opportunities, uh, lot, diminished real estate sales, diminished home value. You add all of that up, and you extend it over several years, and those costs just dwarf the amount of money that they actually had to spend in hard dollars to dig a new well or put in a treatment system. So it underscores the importance of being really, of having a long-term vision here and trying to protect our water. And I just wanted to show a map, and Bill, I don't know if I missed one of your slides, whether it might have shown this or not, but it indicates to us, if you can zoom in on this, some of the vulnerability that we have to water pollution in, in the community. This map has a lot of fancy little blue lines. This is, this is not a computer-generated computer, a computer map. This is done with a felt tip pen, but, but, it, but it is uh, based on computer modeling of the Missoula Valley Aquifer. And again, to orient you, this, this area in here is the Missoula downtown area. These little red dots are public supply wells, many of which are mountain water company wells, but some of which, in, uh, for instance, this one is the Omar Estates well, for a subdivision that's about six miles west of town. These blue lines are the zones of contribution to those wells. What that means is, uh, in basic, very plain terms, is that that's where the water comes from. It goes into these wells. The water comes from uh, this area, probably upstream of this area. The Clark Fork River provides the water that comes into our aquifer, roughly 80, 85% of the, the water that flows into our aquifer. And it flows out along these little lines out to where we pump in these wells. Now, if we have a contaminant source here in Missoula, it can affect a well that's six miles downstream because that's where their water comes. That's where their water comes from. And it may get there in a very short period of time. The water from Elmar Estate Subdivision's wells six miles west of town originates somewhere between Orange Street, or excuse me, Russell Street and Orange Street in downtown Missoula. And it, crosses, it goes underneath the Missoula urban area, where there's a variety of, of pollution sources potentially contributing contamination to the aquifer, and extending a long way out of town. So we can, we can uh, impact an area, impact a lot of people a long ways away. 
with pollution sources in Missoula, and it can cost us dearly in terms of having to replace those water supplies, and also in terms of long-term costs to the community in terms of our our, our economic prosperity. I just wanted to say that. Okay. There you have it. Um, for those of you who are interested in about um, individually what you can do to help the aquifer, there's a little, they want to get a zoom in on this. There's a little uh, door hanger or refrigerator hanger or cork board hanger um, that I believe the Clark Fork Ponderé Coalition put together telling you some of the alternatives, what you can do with paint, what you can do with your oil locally in the community. Um, what you should do with antifreeze or pesticides or fertilizers. Um, they also suggest that if you have any further questions, you call the city, city County Health Department at 523-4755. If you have some things hanging out in your garage that you've been meaning to dispose of and you don't know how, call the County Health Department. And that number again is 523-4755. In that regard, Tracy, if I said I could put in a little plug for an event for planning in September, on September 21st, we're going to have a household hazardous waste collection day in Missoula. We haven't had one in Missoula since the mid 1980s, and we had that one in, in the, at that time. We, was, we were overwhelmed with the response that we got, and it took in much more hazardous waste from households than we ever thought we would. Uh, we're planning a new one here in September. It will be very limited in scope. One of the most important things that we'll have at that at that on, on that day is a paint exchange where people can bring in paint instead of throwing it away, putting it in the dumpster or putting it down the drain, bring it in and let somebody else come and pick it up and use it. And we'll hope to uh, have a lot of people both bringing in some paint that they can no longer use, but also be able to pick up paint that they'll be able to come with it, that you can put, put to a productive use. We'll also accept uh, waste uh, oil paint, waste paint thinner, uh, waste oil, and uh, waste car batteries. All these things are very common, high volume waste in the community that we can uh, recycle and, and uh, make some use out of or dispose of more properly than putting them into the aquifer. Uh, it's a real good opportunity, and this will be funded uh, by the uh, City and County Health Department's Water Quality District, the City Sewage Treatment Plant, and the uh, hopefully contribution from, uh, from other businesses. That again is on September 21st. So go check out your garage and what has been stacking up there, you now have the chance to get rid of. Um, well, I'd like to thank you for tuning in this evening, naturally speaking. You can tune in again Friday at 1 o'clock if you came in late and want to catch the beginning of the show. They'll be, MCAT will be airing that again. Again, that's Friday at 1. Um, Naturally Speaking appears the fourth Tuesday of every month. Ronnie Schwann should be back next month to host this fine show. I'd like to thank our guests, Peter Nielsen, Bill Wissner, Arvid Hiller, and Charlie Bendham. I'm Tracy Stone Manning. Good night. Ah. Uh -huh.